So, two friends of mine and I went to Nashville to watch a football game a few weeks ago. We stayed at an Airbnb that we have never stayed at before, but it was a good deal and we all got our own bedroom. The first thing we noticed was a door in the middle of the hallway. It was not a bedroom. It was a door to the basement. The walkway down was as creepy as one could imagine. It looked like something out of The Conjuring with stone walls and rickety stairs. My friends thought it was a little creepy, but I got an immediate feeling of uneasiness and discomfort. The hair on my arms stood straight up as my friends decided to go down into the basement and look around. The next thing we noticed was that the door would not close. There was no latch and no way to keep the door closed, so we decided to put a basket in front of the door to keep it shut. We went to the game and then out afterwards and got back to the house around 2.30 a.m. The door was closed, but the basket was pushed away from the door by about five feet. My friends didn't think much of it in their drunken state, but this really did not sit well with me. I begrudgingly went to my room to go to sleep, making sure to lock the door behind me. I woke up around 8 a.m. the next morning and heard the doorknob to my room slowly turning. The door being locked, it wouldn't open, and I figured it was my friends trying to get me up for breakfast. Then I hear a very distinctive shh come from the other side of the door. Not thinking it was anything other than my friends, I just went back to sleep. About an hour later, my friends got back from breakfast and I got up. I asked them why they tried to open my door this morning and why they were shushing people. They both looked at me confused and asked what I was talking about. They were very adamant that they did not try to open my door and that they did not shush anyone. I spent a year studying in Mexico recently, as you do on exchange. I tried to travel as much as I could. Between the semesters, there was a big break, and me and my buddy that I spent most of my time with during the exchange decided we go on a longer backpacking trip through Mexico together. We had a rough plan on where to go and what we wanted to see, but we hadn't even booked our flight back yet, and we weren't even sure where we would take it from. We wanted to keep it flexible. We had an amazing time, and a few days before our trip ended, we finally decided we would take our flights from a city that was close and had really cheap flights. But the city itself didn't really have anything to offer. Then, on Airbnb, we found a room, very close to the airport, in a house with a pool. So we thought we'd just treat ourselves to a relaxed pool day at the end of the trip. It turned out that the hosts were a family. The husband was Mexican, and the wife was from Europe, and could even speak our native language. So we arranged that we would take a bus to the airport, and that they would pick us up from there. When we finally arrived at the city, it was already dark, and the bus driver refused to drive us to the airport, since it was not directly on his route. So he just dropped us off on the highway. That was already a pretty bad situation to begin with, standing with our backpacks at the side of the road in the middle of nowhere in a not-so-safe city in Mexico. But I called the hosts and sent them our GPS location, and they say no problem, they will come get us. So the husband came to pick us up, and it was already a very uncomfortable situation, getting into the car with a stranger in the night, in the middle of nowhere. It also didn't help that the guy looked like Danny Trejo, without a mustache, and as I tried to make small talk with him, he only gave monosyllabic answers or straight out ignored me. Well, he's not just a big talker, I thought, and hoped we would soon arrive. Looking back, I can see a million red flags, but for some reason, at that time, we just didn't see them. Either we were too tired, or to be honest, we didn't really have any other choice but to go along anyway. But yes, we arrived. And that should have immediately set alarms off. We were in the middle of nowhere. There were fields with sheep and goats around. And all of a sudden, a gravel road branches off from the paved road. And along that gravel road, there are about six huge mansions. All with two meter walls around them. Topped with NATO fence, huge gates, and at least two gigantic guard dogs per house. When we entered the house, we were greeted by the wife. A bubbly, middle-aged woman. That was very talkative but still pleasant. 
She had actually cooked dinner for us, and we ate, while exchanging small talk. The husband just sat at the table, not saying a single word. After dinner, we more or less went directly to bed, because it had gotten late, and we were tired from the long day. The next morning, we saw the weather was not that good, so we decided to go into the town, and just see the few touristy things it had to offer, instead of spending it at the pool. When we came back, it was already dark, but we decided to jump in the pool anyways, to cool off, because it was very hot and humid. The wife joined us, and at some point, my friend made the mistake to ask how they were able to afford such a house. It didn't really match the price range of what they were telling us that they were doing, and she deflected a bit and added that her husband was very handy. He had grown up in the streets and basically built the house himself. We realized it might not be the best topic and broke the conversation off. That was the last day of our trip, and we had a flight back home early the next morning. We still had some weed left that we had bought on the trip, and we thought it would be nice to smoke one out since it was our last night. But as this was a family home and they had kids around, we thought it would be better to speak to our hosts first if they would mind. So later in the evening, we asked the wife if it would be okay if we smoked out on the terrace, which for some reason she found quite amusing and started laughing. She shouted to her husband, who was lying on the couch watching TV. My love, the boys ask if it would be okay if they smoke some weed. What do you think? And he just laughed, but didn't give an answer. We looked at her with dumbfounded expressions, and she told us sure, just go ahead. So we went to the terrace and start smoking our joint. Later they joined us, and we had a chat, and this is where things got really messed up. For some reason, they start asking all sorts of questions about the weed, where we got it, how much it was, who we got it from, and how much we would have to pay for it back in Europe. They just seemed way too interested in the weed, and at one point, the wife just nonchalantly revealed to us, yes, we thought about doing that as a source of income, selling weed, but too many people die doing that because the cartels don't like that. Actually, my husband used to make people go missing for doing that. I immediately felt sober, and as if he read my mind, her husband added, yes, when I was about 16, I used to make a lot of people go missing for the cartel in exchange for money, and he said it in a tone, as if he just said he used to mow lawns when he was a teenager. I still thought I must have misunderstood, so I texted my friend, who was sitting across the table from me, trying not to make eye contact, because I knew we would freak each other out. He confirmed that I had indeed understood right. We discuss what we should do, and agree that there's no immediate threat, and that we should just stay. We don't have anywhere else to go anyways, and it's already very late. But things got even crazier. We tried to keep our composure, and not completely freak out, while still making conversation with our hosts, a few minutes later though, the husband got up and went inside to get something, and he came back with a kilogram of weed, pressed into a brick. He proceeded to break bits off the brick and roll them into a joint that would probably have knocked out Snoop Dogg. It was about the size of my thumb, and I guess it had about two grams of weed in there. Of course, he offered the joints to us, but we politely declined, saying that we were already pretty stoned. He seemed a little offended, but fortunately, he bought our excuse, but it got even worse. A few minutes later, we hear a couple of loud bangs. The wife became a bit uneasy and asked, what was that? To which she calmly answered, nine millimeters, to confirm my suspicion that that was indeed shots. I would say it was around seven or something shots, fired pretty quickly after each other. The wife got nervous and asked if we should maybe go inside and asked him, what do you think they're shooting at? In the air? At cows? At people? But he just shrugged it off, and we stayed outside. Again, a few minutes later, there were more shots. This time, even closer, the wife got even more upset and asked again, should we maybe go inside? What do you think they're shooting at? Should we go inside? And I think I will never forget when he answered in the calmest way imaginable. No, everything's okay. I don't hear any screams yet. I don't know why, but the way he just calmly said that freaked me out, and is still making my heart beat whenever I think about it. 
After that, we quickly excused ourselves and went to our room. When we could finally talk, and we both lost it and panicked. Just what were we supposed to do? We're locked in a house with a contract killer in the middle of absolutely nowhere, and people are shooting outside. We decided that it was probably best to stay, because we thought, well, we are his guests. He's not going to harm us, hopefully. And it's better to have walls and dogs in between us and the people shooting around. So we barricaded ourselves in the room and didn't sleep a second until morning. When we noped out of there and went to the airport, I was never so happy to be patted down at security my whole life. My husband and I got married during Level 3 lockdown in New Zealand. We wanted to do something special the night of our wedding, so we got an Airbnb in a harbor near where we live. The place was the back of someone else's house and kind of in a forest. It was also pretty small, one room and a bathroom. we had just gotten married, so we were acting very in love that night, for lack of a better word. We also had the windows open because we believed that where we were was very remote. When we decided to go to sleep, my husband decided that since we were in New Zealand, there was no need to lock the door. And like an idiot, I went along with this. We go to sleep, and a few hours later, roughly 3am, there is a distinct loud knocking on the wall that our heads are laying against. There were about seven knocks, spaced out evenly to be exact. It was the kind of sound that, to me, was deliberately trying to wake us up. I shrieked, and then my husband looked out the window for movement. There wasn't any movement or sound after, just extremely still. What's also weird is that the Airbnb had motion-sensing lights on the opposite side of where the knocking came from. It was almost like whoever it was knew not to set off the lights. I know in my gut that this knock came from a person and not an animal or the wind. After a few hours of being terrified, we didn't hear anything else for the rest of the night. The next day, I asked the Airbnb host about it. They said they didn't know anything and were genuinely sorry. They even let us stick around past checkout to enjoy the view a little longer. To be honest, I genuinely don't think it was them. My experience happened in Malaysia back in March of 2018. To better understand the scenario from my perspective, I will paint a small picture of who I am. I am a strength athlete, trained in Muay Thai for a few years proficient in self-defense, and served in the military as a commando for two years. With my background, I am a confident individual and not easily phased. Back to the trip, there were seven of us, five males and two females, booked air tickets to Malaysia for a short vacation, along with a rather affordable Airbnb condominium apartment that was huge enough to fit all of us. Upon reaching the apartment, we opened the door and I was the first to enter. I would always do a quick recce around the new environment to make sure it was safe and have the layout in my mind, which was a military habit. As I walked towards the master bedroom, I froze. The room was dark as the lights were off and the curtains were fully closed. My instincts kicked in as I froze right outside the master bedroom door. I thought to myself, what the hell? I have never felt something like this before in my life. The unexplained sense of fear that even my trained mind and body is preventing me from taking another step. It was at that moment I felt something was off. As I stood there for the next five seconds, with various thoughts going through my mind, my friends caught up to me and they went right into the room. They barged right in, opened the curtains wide, which exposed the balcony right outside. As most of them were smokers, they could barely contain themselves after the plane ride and decided to puff a few at the open balcony. As seven of us stood there for a chat while enjoying the high-rise scenery, one of them pointed something out. 
a graveyard, a graveyard just a few kilometers away, that was clearly within sight. We looked at each other and soon realized why the Airbnb condominium apartment that was large enough to fit seven of us was such a good price. That was the end of my personal encounter, but the start of my friends. In case you're wondering, no, I did not choose the master bedroom. Someone else did. After the first night, one of the female friends looked a bit unwell. I asked the others what's up, thinking it could be her period. I went to her room to check up on her, to see if she needed anything. Turns out, she had a nasty nightmare, in which she refused to share what it was about, and she woke up with a high fever. On the second day, one of the guys, Alex, had stomach discomfort. We assumed it was food poisoning from all the feasting being done when you're overseas. In the early afternoon, three of them decided to head out on foot to the nearest mall, while three of us decided to head down to the swimming pool. And of course, Alex opted to stay in the apartment so he wouldn't have any accidents in the pool. At around 4 p.m., when we finished our swim, we headed back to the apartment. I didn't bother to ring the doorbell, as I figured Alex might be sleeping or resting. As I inserted the key, unlocked the door, and turned the handle, I heard a loud slam in the apartment. I swung the door right open and was ready to engage, thinking there was an intruder, as it was a foreign country. Turns out, Alex was lying on the living room couch with a blanket over him, watching television, while the loud slam was actually the sound of the dining room chair that had fallen over. Upon analyzing the scenario, I realized Alex was clearly in shock. I asked him what happened. He said that the dining room chair had just tippled and fell by itself the moment I opened the door. Naturally, you would think Alex is screwing with you, but physically, it was impossible for him to push the chair over from the dining room, proceed to run over to the living room, lie down on the couch, and put a blanket over him while I swung the door open in a second. Not like it's a hidden camera prank show, and not to forget about his stomach discomfort. I chose to believe Alex as I grabbed the chair, held it up high, and slam it back into position, and I aggressively told whatever was there to back off right now. The trip was over. A few days later, I met up with the guy who chose the master bedroom. I asked Ben if he had any weird encounters back in Malaysia, and not to my surprise, he did. While using his phone on the bed, facing up, he would often see shadows fly past the curtains. While he was going to the bathroom in the master bedroom toilet, he heard a knocking sound by the toilet door and thought it was me trying to disturb him. He asked me to quit it, only to soon realize and feel that it wasn't me who was outside. He mentioned that he originally wanted to stay in the apartment and was too lazy to join for the swim. But the creeps he got from the apartment made him want to get out of there. My husband and I went to an event with our friends and stayed in an Airbnb apartment. It was a cute old place above a little store in a small town. It never once felt creepy or uncomfortable the days we were there. On the last night we went to our rooms, my husband was falling asleep while I stayed up looking at photos from the event on my phone and talking to my sisters in a group text when out of nowhere I hear a whisper from the door. It called my name and told me to come out into the hall. It was the voice of my friend in the other room, but it wasn't her because she was asleep. Her boyfriend had carried her to bed after she fell asleep on the couch. Besides, if she needed me, she would have texted me first, or at least made sure she had my attention, before just whispering a sentence and hoping I heard it. Normally, I would have gone after it, but after that, I slowly got extremely freaked out, I almost worked into a panic attack, and shaking, which I don't do. They didn't believe me that it happened, and my husband just believes that I believe I heard something.
I'm currently in Prague, Czech Republic. I usually rent an apartment whenever I travel, and I've never had an issue with any apartment in the past. I know Prague is very rich in history, especially when it comes to ghosts, gory history, etc. Within the first few days in my apartment, my cousin sent me an article about lemons. Maybe you've seen this floating around the internet. The trick is to place lemons where you have an explained activity, and if the lemons turn green and moldy, they have absorbed the negative energy, or something to that effect. I didn't pay much attention to it, but I did buy lemons for cooking with, and within 72 hours, they had turned green like I had never seen before. I suppose it could just be a bad batch of lemons though, right? Then the following week, I was waiting for the shower to heat up. As I was watching the water run, a black blob of a shadow about the size of a large grapefruit or a small melon came out of the shower head and fell to the floor. Picture dropping a grapefruit. It was of similar speed you would expect a grapefruit to fall and with a similar splat, ending when it hits the ground. When it landed on the shower floor, it seemed to morph or melt from its circular-like shape into liquid form and slithered down the drain. I've never seen black blobs, and in my experience, most black figures are not nice. And two weeks ago, I was laying in bed reading. I looked up from my iPad, and a white mist was floating over me and going out the bedroom door. I've never seen this mist before, but I have been attacked by a bubble-like entity that would hover over me when I slept and strangle me. This mist was very white, very light moving. It didn't seem ominous at all. I rolled over to tap my husband to wake up, and there were massive white wings flapping over his side of the bed. They were absolutely stunning and beautiful. I could see the feathers in such great detail, but I couldn't see where the wings joined each other, or what they were attached to. The wings started to ascend and went up to the 12 foot ceiling and disappeared. Between reading and surfing on my iPad, I was silently talking to my mother, who passed away two years ago. We are in Prague for a type of fertility treatment that isn't offered in our home country. I was begging her to finally let this be our time. I rarely receive signs from her, which I find frustrating, because this woman, when her dad passed away, she could literally command a sign at any time, and her dad would send one. So I was always upset why she wouldn't do the same for me. Was this my mom? Was this incident with the mist and wings her? We found out this week we are indeed pregnant. But the real test is whether the pregnancy sticks as the rest haven't. One thing I find most intriguing about this apartment though is a locked room. It has a sign on it saying private. I'm nosy. I tried all of our keys, and naturally they don't open this locked door. It's an old door with an old style long skeleton lock. During the day, I can look through the keyhole into the room. And there has to be a window because the room is super bright. Initially, I thought the owners used it as storage, but it's not. It's a child's room. There's bunk beds and other furniture. This creeped me out. It looks relatively untouched and that it could be used at any time. Now I'm wondering if something happened here and the owners are renting it out because they can't part with the memories. I could totally be reading too much into it, but maybe these experiences aren't related to me and are instead related to the apartment. Hey guys, I hope you've enjoyed the video. I can't believe that we've reached 3,000 already. I owe you all a big thanks, and I appreciate all the love and support you guys are sending me. I'm really grateful. So if any of you are listening and you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and do so. Don't forget to leave a like and comment, because it really does help with the YouTube algorithm. And I also like to have a chat with you guys. And don't forget to turn on notifications, so you're updated whenever I release a new video. All my socials are in the description, so if you want to get in contact with me on Reddit or Twitter, you can do so there. 
and I've also got a collaboration with Mortis Media, so head over to his channel and give it a listen to. And if by chance you haven't subscribed to him either, go ahead. So once again guys, thank you for everything. I'll see you in the next one.